Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. This is Seth Mayo again, curator of astronomy for the Loman Planetarium at MOAS. And in this edition, we are covering the dates of June 27th through July 3rd. As we transition into the month of July, we're going to provide another update on those planets in the early morning that are still nicely lined up. Then we're going to pay attention to the east in the evening as we watch the great summer triangle asterism rise higher and higher. And we'll end with a look at the celestial highlights for the month of July. So let's take a look. Heading back to the early morning sky, once again, looking towards the east before sunrise, we still have that great view of all of those planets we can see strewn across the sky. And if you were tuning in last week and kind of paying attention to this area, you may have noticed particularly on Friday morning, the 24th, the moon was in a really good position. So we had Mercury down here nearest the sun, then Venus shining brightest, the beautiful crescent moon, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn a little farther away. And I went out early in the morning looking towards the east, and since we're near the beach, I could go out there with as much of an unobstructed horizon as I could get. And I took this fisheye image because I needed a lens wide enough to capture Saturn, which is much farther away. Now, Mercury was a little tough for me to capture in the photo, but I did luckily get a chance to see it with my naked eyes. There's a little bit of haze just above the eastern horizon, which can happen quite often. But it was so cool to see these planets line up in order, just like they are in the solar system. And so that was kind of a nice treat there. Now, of course, moving on to this week, the moon has now gone closer and closer to the sun. So as we went through last weekend here, we saw the moon get close to Venus. This was Sunday morning, the 26th, when you saw Venus and the moon really close, and even the Pleiades star cluster just above. But then we moved into Monday morning when the very thin crescent got a little bit closer to Mercury right here. And then by the 28th is officially a new moon when the sun shines the backside of the moon. We can't see the moon at all. but. We still have that great view of these planets, something we don't always get, especially in this order, very often. As we move into July, this is a great time of year if you're looking towards the east to look at and appreciate the Summer Triangle. These three bright stars you find in the summertime that make up this beautiful asterism that is one of the most recognizable and easiest to find in our sky and can be seen for most of the year. It rises at a good position, it gets really high in the sky, which means it can last for a very long time. And just as a reminder, an asterism is not as formal as a constellation. It is a star pattern or shape. And much of the time, asterisms are made up of very bright stars, so they're easy to find and can be made up of different constellations. And that is the case for the Summer Triangle. Actually, it connects three separate constellations together. And the vertices of the triangle are the brightest stars in each of those constellations. So we're going to go to each one and talk about them. And we'll start with the closest star to us. And that is the star Altair, what we find right there. Altair is one of our neighbors, about 16.7 light years from us. Altair is a hot A-type star, about two times the size of the sun, and it's rapidly rotating. So it kind of bulges at its equator, and it is the second brightest star inside the summer triangle. Now the name Altair has Arabic roots, which means the eagle star, and that makes sense because it's part of the eagle constellation known as Aquila, the eagle. Sometimes it forms one of the wings of the eagle, sometimes the head of the eagle. It depends on the drawing and the artist who created it, but I'll show it to you in Stellarium here. And in this case, in Stellarium, it forms kind of the neck or head of this grand eagle in the sky. And this eagle, going back to Greek mythology, sometimes is tied to Zeus. It was the bird who carried his thunderbolts, Zeus's primary weapons that he used. So Aquila was famous for carrying those thunderbolts. Now, as we move to the next nearest star in the Summer Triangle, it's actually the brightest of all three and the fifth brightest star of the entire night sky. If you're looking out anywhere in the sky, especially in the spring and summer, it is the second brightest star you can see right now, at least in the evening sky behind Arcturus that we've talked about recently. And this is the star Vega here at the top. Now, Vega is still pretty close to us at about 25 light years away. The light takes about 25 years to travel from that star 
to get to us, so also considered kind of a neighbor of ours. And as we mentioned a couple episodes ago, Vega is a white bluish star, about twice as big as the sun, about twice as massive, and burning through its fuel much faster than our sun. Another rapidly rotating star, so it's bulged at its equator, and a very well-studied star. It's so bright and fairly close to us. Now, this star is part of the very tiny constellation of Lyra the Harp. And Lyra looks like a little parallelogram. If you look close enough, that's the main part of this very tiny constellation. It actually is one of the smallest constellations of all of the night sky. We'll draw it for you here. And then we'll put up the picture as well to add a little more imagination. So there's Lyra the harp. And Lyra was the first stringed instrument of its kind, at least from Greek mythology, ever created. At least that's how the stories go. Of course, it's also known as a lyre, which according to mythology was built by Mercury or Hermes the messenger god, who then gifted it to Apollo, who had many roles. One of them was the god of music. And Apollo, in some stories, gifted it to a mortal man named Orpheus, who was the best lyre player in the world. So it was passed down to various folks through Greek mythology. But part of a very small constellation, and Vega forms one part of the very tiny grouping of stars here. Now moving to the farthest star away in the triangle and the dimmest, and that is the star Deneb down here, a little bit more towards the north or northeast. Now I say it's the dimmest, but in actuality, this star is very luminous. The reason why it doesn't look as bright as these other two is because it's much farther away. Deneb is around 2,600 light years away. Now there's a lot of uncertainty of the accuracy of its distance. It can vary by quite a bit depending on the source. Sometimes you see it in the thousand range, sometimes in the 2,000 up to 3,000 range, it just depends. So around 2,600 light years away, which is truly very, very far away for a star are, and as bright as Deneb is still at that distance, it tells you it must be very luminous. And that definitely is the case. Because if you went to the star, it is 100 to maybe 250,000 times brighter than our sun and maybe 200 times larger. If you put Deneb where our sun is, it would extend out to Earth, a massive blue white star. One of the biggest and brightest that you can actually find in our entire night sky as seen from Earth, which is so cool. The star's origin is also Arabic, which means the tail, and it's the tail star of Cygnus the Swan. This is actually one of my favorite constellations in the sky. If you ever find it, it looks like a giant cross shape. Some people call it the Northern Cross, that's the asterism. So there's an asterism within an asterism. And Cygnus the Swan, this beautiful swan in Greek mythology, may have been a creature, Zeus, the god of all the gods, that he turned himself into to impress a woman named Leda, who eventually, they both had kids. Some of them were the Gemini twins. Also, Helen of Troy was another one of their kids. So famous character that he wooed, and he initially did that by turning himself into a swan to impress her. This is one of the ways that Cygnus is remembered in the sky, but it makes for a great constellation. And again, one of my favorites, it's really noticeable. And what I love about it, especially if you go to a dark location, is that Cygnus flies right through the Milky Way. And so if you can't really find the Milky Way, if you're in a light polluted area, a lot of times I use Cygnus to signify where the Milky Way should be if I can't see it. So it makes for a really nice pointer for the direction of the Milky Way in our sky. So all three of these stars and constellations are interesting, forming that great summer triangle that is now rising in a great area of the sky in the east in the evening and can be seen for most of the night, so I'm sure you'll be seeing some of this at some point soon. For the month of July, let's take a look at some of those celestial highlights to look out for, and we're gonna start on July 4th, Independence Day here in the United States, of course, and that is when we'll be at Aphelion. That is when we're farthest from the sun in our orbit around it, which is always kind of confusing because here in the summer, you'd feel like it'd be closer to the sun, but it's actually the opposite. In the summer, we're farther away, at least our Northern Hemisphere summer. And in our winter time, in January, we're actually closest, that's called perihelion. So this is when we're about 94.5 million miles away from the sun. On average, we're about 93 million miles away. It's not a huge difference between perihelion and aphelion, about a 3% change. But there is a difference, and this year we're celebrating that on July 4th. On Wednesday, July 13th, we have another 
full moon and another super moon, just like we had one in June. And just remember, a super moon doesn't look that much different than a regular full moon, but it just means it's a little bit closer to us and a little bit bigger and brighter, which might be slightly noticeable, but not by a lot. And this is something we also call a perigee moon. And typically the full moon in July is called the buck moon when male deers in certain parts of the world are growing their antlers once again. So it kind of relates to that time frame. So we have our full buck moon, a super moon happening on July 13th. If we stick with the moon just a couple nights later when it's in its waning phases, we'll find the moon gets pretty close to the planet Saturn. Now what's great is by the middle of July, Saturn will be rising at about 11 p.m. So it won't be so late, or I guess you could say so early, to find Saturn along with some of those other planets as well. So Saturn will be the first to see in the evening since it's much farther from those other planets. And again, in the middle of the month, you'll find the moon getting close to it. And if we move to that morning after, where we still will have all of these planets strewn across the sky here, there's Venus, then we have Mars and Jupiter, but you'll notice that one planet is missing and that is the planet Mercury. By the first and second week of July, Mercury was plunging towards the glare of the sun, getting harder and harder to see. And by the morning of July 16th, Mercury will be at what's called superior solar conjunction. That's when it's on the other side of the sun and in line with it, so we cannot see Mercury at all. But we had a good run with Mercury in the sky along with all these planets in the morning, which was really nice, even up to this point. On the evening of July 28th, or really the morning of July 29th, we have the peak of something called the Delta Aquarids, or the Southern Delta Aquarids is another name it goes by. And this is a meteor shower that has a radiant point inside the constellation of Aquarius, the water bearer. The radiant point is near the star Delta Aquarii. That's why it has that name. We can turn on the meteor shower radiant points here, and you can see somewhere fairly near it are the southern Delta Aquarids there. It's a pretty average meteor shower, maybe up to 20 meteors per hour. The good thing is the moon is about a new moon phase by this date. So you don't have the natural light pollution of the moon obscuring it, which may give you a pretty decent show. This runs for most of the summer, which is the result of the debris field of Comet McColtz that we're running through at this time of the year. Let's look at the stars and constellations that are really great for the evening sky in July. And where we're gonna start is in the west, where we're gonna see a leftover spring constellation and one that's good for part of the summer as well, the constellation of Leo the Lion is now beginning to set in the west. But you still have a chance to see it off towards that area of the sky just after sunset as it gets closer to that horizon there. So definitely take advantage of that while it's still in a decent position to see. If we do look above Leo, we'll still have a decent view of the Big Dipper. The asterism, of course, that looks like a giant spoon, which is part of Ursa Major the Great Bear. And even though these are also considered springtime stars and constellations, you still have a good view of Arcturus, part of Boötes the Herdsman, the brightest star in our northern hemisphere sky that really stands out. Below it, we can find the star Spica, part of Virgo the Maiden. So they're getting a little lower to the west, but still in a decent spot to see for a good part of the evening. But of course, we're right in the thick of summertime, and right now we have some great summertime stars to look out for. Looking towards the southeast and south, we find the great S-like constellation right here. It's pretty bright in this part of the sky. This is, of course, Scorpius with the bright star Antares, which marks the heart of the scorpion there, really stands out. Near that tail and stinger, we have the asterism of the teapot here, but also the constellation of Sagittarius, the half-man, half-horse centaur from Greek mythology. This is another gray area of the sky, especially if in a darker location. It's the thickest or densest part of the Milky Way where we find the center of our galaxy. There's that black hole that's situated right about there. It's always fun to find that location in the sky. And just as we mentioned at the beginning of the episode here, we have that great summer triangle, this amazing asterism, these three stars forming a large triangle here that we can find that really stand out in the sky. These three stars are very bright and the constellations are noticeable as well. So we can find that in that part of the sky kind of rising in the east. And just one more constellation I'll mention that's almost straight up in the sky this time of year, especially in July, 
is one that's a little hard to spot, but it's a famous character, and that is of Hercules. I always look for the keystone here, shape. Uh, that's the main part of the body of Hercules, but we'll turn on the rest of him. And there we have this mighty hero and warrior of Hercules high up in the sky. So if you get out there and do some summer stargazing, these are some great constellations and stars to look out for at this time of the year. Thanks again for tuning in to another edition of the program. And if you find yourself in Daytona Beach, please stop by the Museum of Arts and Sciences and definitely check out a show in our Loman Planetarium. If you want any more information about those programs or what we're doing in the museum, you can check out our website and go on to our other social media channels where you can find really great content we're posting about science, art, and history. We hope to see you back here again. Take care and of course, happy stargazing.